Hi everyone, my name is Jack and today we are looking at another horrific case. In your presence. During their time as high school students, Jessica Lester encountered her future spouse, Matthew Boynton. The school is the place where Jessica, who was one year younger than Matthew, was immediately captivated by him. Matthew's grandfather was the sheriff of their small town of Griffin, which made him unique. The state of Georgia. His association with it resulted in him achieving a certain level of privilege and status within the community. Moreover, Matthew's modest attire indicated that he came from an upper-class upbringing. He frequently donned designer clothing brands like Hollister and Ralph Lauren, which added to his fashion sense, enhanced his charm. Jessica was 16 when she found out she was carrying her first child. This news caught her and her then-partner Matthew off guard. Although her grandparents were supportive and willing to help with the baby's upbringing, Jessica was unable to convince them otherwise, was eager to move in with Matthew and start a family. The perfect pairing in December 2014 was evidently Jessica and Matthew. Jessica engaged in a private affair and eventually became pregnant during her brief stay. Matthew, who was determined to take care of the baby himself, opted for Jessica as his wife. His grandfather's career in law enforcement inspired Matthew to take up the job. The footsteps of my grandfather. After graduating from high school, he was employed as a jailer for the Pike County Sheriff's Department. After working for the Pike County Sheriff's Office, Matthew has put in a lot of effort and dedicated his time there. Attracted the attention of law enforcement agencies in Griffin, Georgia, and he was employed as a police officer, the officer in charge of patrol. Jessica and Matthew rented an apartment in Griffin, Georgia, where they settled. Their two young offspring. Sheriff Wendell Beam, who is Matthew's grandfather, played a significant role in shaping their lives. The sheriff was a key player in the lives of both Matthew and Jessica. Jessica's lack of personal resources was a significant obstacle they encountered. Due to her lack of credit card and car, she had no choice but to rely on Matthew. Whenever she needed something, her grandfather was always there. Whenever Matthew was required to work in his patrol car, he would frequently take the keys to his pickup truck. Jessica and two young children were left stranded at home after the truck hit. Despite appearing as the perfect pair onlookers expected, Jessica and Matthew are actually quite cute. That was far from the truth of the world. In the spring of 2016, Jessica discovered that Matthew was cheating with a 911 dispatcher, identified as Courtney. Jessica was resolute in her decision to contact her grandmother for assistance, as well as protect herself and her sons. Assistance. A lawyer was consulted by them and they set up an appointment to discuss their options. Jessica had planned to move in with her sons to her sister's house on Friday, April 15th. A dwelling. A chiropractor was Jessica's source of income, allowing her to make ends meet. Jessica and Matthew went to Walmart between 10 and 16 p.m. on April 15th, and the store was monitored by its CCTV system. Recorded the visit of their visitors. During the visit, the couple and their children were seen purchasing baby formula. Jessica and Matthew had a disagreement at the store. Jessica and Matthew were seen at about 10, 47 p.m., one hour and a half after the initial argument, retreated from Walmart. The CCTV footage reveals them leaving the store together, returning to their apartment. Matthew was on his way to the Waffle House to meet a colleague at approximately 1 p.m. dinner will be served. However, as he approached the restaurant, a man called 911 to request assistance, a medical aid service to be provided at his residence. His request was harrowing as he mentioned that his wife, Jessica, was in distress. He was receiving unsettling text messages and had a tendency to self-harm. Jessica sent her text stating that she was no longer able to do this and would be willing to help the children by taking care of them. My love for them is infectious and unwavering every day. I've been struggling for a while and nobody has noticed. I've been unable to identify myself in the mirror as of late. I've had suicidal thoughts before. The boys and I have strong affection for each other. Matthew reported to 911 that his wife was thinking about taking a break. The dispatcher stated that they would immediately dispatch officers to his residence, despite the fact that she had already passed away. Matthew was asked by the dispatcher if there were any weapons in the home. Yes, as Matthew replied. 
According to him, his service weapon was found in the house. Matthew and Jessica were on their way to the apartment when, as officers headed there, Matthew suddenly appeared, communicated via radio that he detected a gunshot from the interior, his dwelling. He reported that he heard two rounds being fired while climbing the stairs and detected them. The distinct odor of ammo. No response arrived from Matthew at the door, despite attempts to answer. Matthew was informed by the officers that they would be present at the apartment in response to an urgent situation. Within a time frame of two minutes, they demanded that he remain outside the apartment until they arrived. Nevertheless, Matthew voiced his additional worry, given that his wife Jessica was also present. Moreover, their two young offspring. When the officers arrived at Matthew and Jessica's apartment, Matthew stated that he believed there was a problem. The master bedroom closet was where Jessica was located. He expressed his desire for the woman to refrain from shooting the children. The officers reacted by going to the master bedroom closet and finding that there was an object in it. It was secured. They remained unfazed and proceeded to kick the door in to find Jessica. The officers entered the closet and found Jessica slumped over with a Glock in her hand. A pointer weighing 4-0 caliber was placed near her body. Matthew was employed as a police officer and the officers quickly determined that the gun belonged to him in the field of law enforcement. They rushed to remove Jessica's body from the closet and place her on the floor. The master bedroom is located on the upper level. The officers removed Jessica from the closet and found out that she had suffered injuries an inflicted gunshot wound on the. The injury was so serious that Jessica wasn't even close to death. She was swiftly transported by the officers to a waiting ambulance, guaranteeing her immediate safety, medical attention. Without the ordeal, Matthew, Jessica's husband, was visibly upset and emotionally impacted. In a state of tears, Matthew declared his love for his wife. The absence of life left him feeling utterly pitied and helpless. She. Matthew was troubled by his decision to inform their children about Jessica's condition. The way they responded has left them feeling terrified. It's a shame that Matthew didn't get home sooner, he said. He wished he had been able to contact Jessica before she could commit her tragic act. His heart raced with remorse, wondering why he had not taken his duty belt. Instead of storing it in the car, leave it at home. Matthew came to the realization that Jessica had gained something from this minor mishap. The possession of a weapon resulted in her life-threatening injury. At approximately 1.30 a.m., Jessica was flown to Atlanta Medical Center. Following Jessica's hospitalization, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, GBI, confirmed that she had been taken to the hospital, came to investigate the shooting. A dispute prevented the local sheriff's department from conducting an investigation into the incident. Encouraging. Matthew's grandfather was a sheriff. Furthermore, Matthew held the position of a patrol, officer for the local police department, which further distinguished himself from other officers. Concise the situation. The local sheriff's department was prevented from carrying out their duties due to these limitations. An analysis. During this time, Matthew was put on administrative leave while the GBI's investigation is ongoing. Upon Jessica's return to Atlanta, Sheriff Wendell Beam arrived at the scene. The medical facility is where, after arriving, he quickly dispatched a patrol car to Jessica's family home to provide assistance. They were given the devastating news. Sadly, Jessica was not declared dead at the time, but her condition was critical. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation said they searched the apartment at 3 a.m. to Jessica and Matthew. During the search, the GBI discovered bullet holes in the upper section of the closet. Nevertheless, they could not spot any blood on the walls of the closet or the floor. The garments inside. The closet was riddled with blood, with pillows being the primary source of one. Was present with Jessica when the officers discovered her. The GBI conducted interviews with some of Jessica and Matthew's neighbors on the same morning. According to the neighbors, gunshots were observed by them between 10.45 p.m. and midnight, the night prior. One of Jessica and Matthew's neighbors reached out to the GBI agents to report hearing a single incident. A gunshot was heard approximately 20 minutes after the initial sound. The neighbor reported that the second shot occurred a few seconds later than the first, but they were not aware of it. Could not furnish a specific time frame. 
Another report was submitted by the neighbor to the GBI agents. At approximately 11 p.m., this individual claimed to have heard a gunshot. According to a neighbor, an argument was heard in the apartment of Jessica and Matthew from roughly 10 p.m. to 11.30 p.p.p. at approximately the same time. As news of Jessica's tragedy spread throughout Griffin, Georgia, a resident was among the locals. The master bedroom closet was oddly designed with a lock on the inside, but no keyhole was present. On the outer side, a worried neighbor who was aware of all the apartments in Jessica and Matthew's home. In the apartment building, they noticed that there were no distinct closets, and all of them were arranged in this manner. Each had a lock on the inside that could be reached from outside. The doors. The notion fueled doubts about the correctness of the situation. Matthew arrived at 4.18 a.m. on the morning after officers found Jessica shot in her closet and proceeded to investigate. Was interrogated by the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Matthew was informed by the agents that this was a criminal investigation and they requested that it be done with seriousness. He was brought in for a questioning. The agents were told by Matthew that he had no secrets. Matthew revealed to the GBI agents that he had been sent a text during their interview from Jessica, who had thoughts of ending her own life. After being concerned, Matthew hurriedly drove to the apartment and got out of his truck. His arrival was noted. He heard two shots being fired as he approached the apartment. Matthew hurriedly entered the apartment and opened the front door to lend a hand. Subsequently, he proceeded to walk through the apartment and into the hallway leading to the master bedroom. Matthew reached for the closet door and upon reaching it, he discovered it had been locked. He implored Jessica to respond but was not granted. In addition, Matthew disclosed to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents that when he failed to do so, after receiving a response from Jessica, he headed back to the kitchen to retrieve his service radio. He rushed outside while crying and looking shocked. Matthew reported hearing gunshots at 1 a.m. His story did not match up with the accounts of his and Jessica's neighbors. According to neighbors, the gunshots were heard between 10.45 p.m. and midnight. The officers arrived at Jessica's family home and informed them that she had made an attempt. Something was amiss when she took her own life using Matthew's service weapon. His grandmother, who was familiar with her, immediately felt that something was not right. She reminisced about an event where four of her other grandchildren went target shooting, but Jessica didn't recall any, refused to participate, stating that she was uncomfortable with firearms. Her grandmother's suspicions that Jessica would have taken something for herself were fueled by this memory. She had no intention of leaving her two sons behind, let alone her own life. Moreover, Jessica's childhood experiences led to the questioning of her suicidal intent. She had grown up with a close relationship with her grandparents, even though she was an orphan. They were skeptical that she would leave her two young children and commit suicide on her own accord. Sons. Jessica was referred to on her hospital intake when she arrived at the Atlanta Medical Center. A 19-year-old reported that she had shot herself in the right skull. However, the trauma surgeon who operated on her had a divergent view of her injury. Jessica's hands were found to be free from any gunpowder, as stated by the trauma surgeon. Her actions on them suggested that she had not fired the shot herself. The injury to the top of her skull was also present, indicating that she would have had it, to direct the weapon towards her head, downwards. This direction is highly unusual when attempting to end one's life, as it would require complete detachment from the body. A significant and unnatural modification to the firearm. Jessica's bedroom wall was found to have holes on it in another investigation. The implication was that the bullet had been fired at an upward angle when it entered the chamber. The wall positioned at the top of the closet was hit by another bullet, while the other wall was located on the floor. Jessica's findings suggested that someone or something else may have been responsible for her being shot, rather than the other way around, rather than self-inflicted harm. Jessica underwent multiple medical procedures at the Atlanta Medical Center. An intracranial pressure monitor was inserted into her brain as part of one of the procedures. The method was employed to measure and regulate swelling. She was also put into a medically-induced coma. 
The objective was to aid in the recovery of her brain and minimize any additional harm. Meanwhile, Matthew, the husband of Jessica, made the decision to move in with his two sons. Following the tragedy, he went to Courtney's house with his girlfriend. The couple separated a few weeks later. During a subsequent police interview, Courtney conveyed her worries about Matthew's whereabouts. Her conduct was characterized as intimidating, according to her statement. Matthew only visited Jessica on one occasion during her initial three weeks in the hospital, an event that, despite being in a medically induced coma for three weeks, Jessica eventually started to wake up. At the Atlanta Medical Center, Jessica's recovery was so quick that staff referred to her as Jennifer, the miracle child. Jessica's skull had been fractured, but the bullets escaped through it. After waking up from her coma, Jessica was interviewed by agents from the agency about a week later, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. Jessica's memory of that fateful night was brief. According to Jessica's interview, the last thing she remembered was going to Walmart, accompanied by her sons and Matthew. She had no recollection of anything after that. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents inquired about Jessica's conduct the weapon Matthew is currently using in his service. She refuted having handled the gun before, asserting that she had no knowledge of unlocking the safety, the holster's lever. The agents inquired again about Jessica's past entertainment, asking if she had ever entertained a child. Thoughts of self-inflicted harm. Jessica's response to this inquiry was filled with emotion. Tears streamed down her face and she firmly denied any intention of self-harm. She clarified that she was too devoted to her two children to contemplate such an action. The doctor spent a month in the hospital before starting the transfer process. Jessica is being placed in a rehabilitation program. Nevertheless, it was discovered that she did not have insurance, which was a significant issue. Difficult to overcome. Jessica was left in the care of her grandparents as she had no insurance. Jessica's release coincided with her limp, she experienced a range of symptoms such as headaches, temporary memory loss, and ringing bells. The left side of her body was numb due to the swelling in her ears. A sheriff's office deputy arrived three days after Jessica left the Atlanta Medical Center, presented a family violence order to Jessica. In response to a petition filed by Matthew, the court issued this order. There was a reasonable suspicion that family violence had taken place in the past and may have occurred again. It will happen in the future. The order stated that Jessica was prohibited from approaching within 300 yards of Matthew or her partner, minors. The judge vetoed the protective order that had been in place between the parties during the trial, Matthew and Jessica. Matthew and Jessica's children were granted full custody by the judge. Jessica was authorized by the judge to visit her children every Sunday for a duration of four hours or more. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation conducted a thorough investigation into the case, Jessica's demise. The discovery of her DNA was made after examining Matthew's service weapon for forensic evidence. The gun's handle, safety, and trigger are all connected to it. The GBI agents were suspicious of this evidence and believed that Jessica was responsible for the crime, self-harming as a result of shooting. An extensive investigation that lasted for over four and a half months was conducted by GBI agents who collected data, examining different scenarios and examining the evidence presented. Their investigation led them to believe that Jessica had shot herself in the head. There was no evidence to suggest that Matthew or anyone else was involved in the incident. The case was ultimately closed and the GBI agents confirmed that Matthew had not been implicated in any wrongdoing any part in his wife's shooting. Jessica reported the incident to the Griffin Police Department in December 2016. Her belongings were not returned by Matthew. After Jessica regained consciousness from a coma, this complaint was raised due to her having to purchase something. Her original belongings were lost, leading to the need for new clothes. A retainer was one of the things that were specifically absent. In a written statement, Matthew assured the authorities that he had not kept his cell phone and had provided an affidavit, any items that are included in Jessica's collection. Matthew's ownership of the item was eventually discovered by the Griffin Police Department. His statement under oath did not erase Jessica's gym bag, which contained her possessions. Ignore having it. 
The disclosure caused Matthew to be compelled to leave the police department, and he renounced his badge and service weapon. He was charged by the department with two felonies, including making false statements and violating his license, the oath of office. Nonetheless, Matthew was never brought to trial for these offenses. Matthew, who was still the legal guardian of his and Jessica's sons, found himself in a challenging position. His children declined to stay with their father in 2018. The children would cry and cling to Jessica whenever she picked them up as if they were her own little girl. Desire not to remain with their father. Jessica acknowledged the need to address these concerns and recounted what her sons had told her, instructed her to seek help from Child Protective Services. Jessica was allowed to stay with her children as long as they were in the investigation. After a thorough review, Child Protective Services closed the case in the spring of 2019. The reports and suggestions put forth by the child psychologist. The psychologist report indicated that the children should be removed from their womb. Spend time with Matthew. Jessica's life has been altered since she was shot in the head. Following the incident, she relocated to search for a new home and moved north of Griffin, Georgia, two hours later. A new beginning for. This decision enabled her to flee from the persistent reminders of her traumatic past. It was in this new place that Jessica fell in love and decided to start a new chapter of her life, the essence of life. She was betrothed to a loving boyfriend who comprehended and felt the pain of her absence. Moreover, Jessica's life has been enhanced by the addition of another child to their family. Her son's birth brought her joy and renewed purpose to her life. 